you have your Bible, I would like to invite you to open to chapter 28. The very last word in chapter 28 in my Bible, I don't know what it says in your Bible. I guess I could just come and look and see. Who's got Acts 28 open? All right, Acts 28, and the last word is boldly and without hindrance preach the kingdom of God. Boldly and without hindrance. Who has it here? What's the last word in this? Preach the kingdom of God as he was taught. Boldly and without hindrance. Boldly and without hindrance. Somebody else? Who's got it here? What's the very last? Boldly and without hindrance. Boldly and without hindrance. The idea is unhindered. Not chained, not bound. And all through Acts we've seen Paul from the very beginning as he watched the stoning of Stephen go through a struggle, a self-internal struggle to do what Jesus has called him to do and to try to figure out why all the other Jews are just not jumping on that, just wanting that. Paul struggled with that. We're going to see today that he loved the Jews. He was a Jew. And it so concerned him that they weren't as thankful for the cross as he was. So the message title is uh, Thanksgiving for Thankless People. Have any of you been thankless recently in your life? Come on now, honestly. We're all a little bit thankless at times. Some are full of thanks. Some are not. That's just reality. Oftentimes we've got things to be thankful for, but we don't see them. And so all around us here, some are full of thanks. Wow. Some are not. I've got a good friend, my wife and I. Really, it was a family friend that uh, came to a Bible study at our home for years. And she came to a real deep relationship with uh, Jesus Christ. And we saw her grow and we saw her change from being a woman. And uh, Jackie may be listening to this message. She still follows the messages that uh, we have up on the website. But Jackie, if you're listening, and by the way, she did give me permission to share this story. Jackie was not someone who really was so into serving other people at the drop of a hat. Jackie was like most of us. She wanted things her way. Isn't that how we are a lot of the times? Now, Jackie did it in a very pleasing way. Wonderful person to be around from the very first uh, opportunities that we had to get to know each other. Uh, our friendship just was, was very tight, although uh, she's probably uh, 15 to 20-ish years. Jackie, I'm not going to say how old you are on tape, but uh, she was in the seniors ministry at the church. But I was talking to her, catching up with her last week on the phone, and she told me a story that fit in with this message. I asked permission if I could share it. She's up in a senior living community up in Idaho, uh, 55 and above, and so they have a little community uh, building there, and they're getting ready for the holiday seasons. And so they were in there maybe playing some games or gathering together, having fun, doing a potluck. And so afterwards, the uh, men were getting ready to take some things outside to get ready for the Christmas season. And so some of the men were uh, going outside carrying some boxes, and Jackie very graciously took the door and held it open, even with a bum knee and a bad back. She's there holding the door open. And these two elderly gentlemen walk out the door, and they're walking on down the sidewalk. And Jackie just thinks, where, where was the thank you? Have you ever felt that way? You do something for someone, and you're not actually wanting them to repay you with a thank you, but it's just a normal place to throw in a thank you. You know, during the day, we have those places in life, and we think, hmm, that's a good place to say thank you. And we say thank you, and do you look at the people's eyes that receive that thank you? They just kind of, wow. 
wow, really? Anyway, Jackie's holding the door, and these two men walk on out. And so Jackie, in her true self, says, thank you. No response, of course. And then so she says, you're welcome. People in their hearts want to give thanks. But the problem is that the world around us brings so many problems in front of us that we lose sight of the thanks that we should be giving. And that's what Thanksgiving is all about. We're going to see that with Paul. Paul was caught up with people that had so much to be thankful for. These Jews that had a very intimate relationship with God for a very long time. But these Jews had lost track of the thankfulness they had to the God who saved the world and put the rainbow up as the promise in the sky. The God who promised Abraham that he would number as the sand and the seas. The God who promised Joshua the promised land as he would go into it. The God who would defeat the enemies of the Jews. The God that would give them David and all the prophets to proclaim the coming of Jesus Christ. And the God that would literally become a human being, a man. He would leave heaven and come down into the world. And he would die for us. They had so much to be thankful for. And Paul wanted so much to give them the good news and to see them receive it. But it just didn't happen. How often do you have something that you know is good to share with someone and you want them so badly to be able to understand it and hear it and receive it, but they just reject it? Folks, basically that's called sin. We get wrapped up in ourselves, don't we? We think about our circumstances and our surroundings and we'll feel like What's happening to us is really more important than what's happening to other people around us. And that's when we become self-focused, selfish, and the word for that is sin. Really, when we want to think about sin, sin is not just what you do. Certainly, it's sinful to do certain things. But the heart that is empty, that doesn't understand what God has done for us. That's the heart that's going to be bent or will lean towards selfishness. How many times have I mentioned Adam and Eve since I've been here in this pulpit? If we don't understand the core fault behind what was going through Adam and Eve's mind then we won't be able to understand sin as we understand it today because it's no different. Adam and Eve wanted what they couldn't have. They wanted what they shouldn't have. They wanted to be who they were not supposed to be. And they were so wrapped up in that, that's all they saw. They saw what they thought was good for them, what they thought would make them happy, what they thought thought would give them something to be thankful for and all the while God saying don't do that don't do that it won't bring you joy it won't bring you peace it won't bring you thankfulness but yet they kept pushing and pushing and wanting it and reaching for it and finally after a while they got what they wanted but they really didn't want what they got they got what they wanted But in the end, they really did not want what they got. Isn't that so true with our kids? How often do we tell our kids, you don't really want that? But they're convinced they want it. They need it. They have to have that to make their life complete. It's either an ungodly relationship with a boy or a girl that's making them feel special about themselves because they're telling them all the things the world would tell them. Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you're so attractive. Oh, I love your hair. 
Oh, your makeup's just gorgeous. I want to be with you. Can I be with you? Please let me be with you. And dad's got a baseball bat just saying, yeah, come around my house and let me just let you be with her just for one moment. You see, these young girls, they don't know what they're looking for. They want to be loved, cherished, and cared for. And that's all of our basic needs. We want to feel special. But instead of recognizing that we are special because of what God's done in and for us and through Jesus to give us, we keep looking for those things that we think we want to be thankful for. And then when we do get them, we realize that we really did not want them to begin with. And that's the story of Paul's life in a nutshell. All of these chapters so far in Acts is about Paul thinking what he wanted to be was the very best Jew a Jew could be. And he tried his whole life to live up to that standard. He went to school, he studied, he kept the law, he memorized the scripture, he walked the walk, he talked the talk of the Jew, he did everything he thought he needed to do, but he still came up empty. And then one day, he met Jesus, and he realized all along, in the law, in the prophets, in the teaching, in the temple, in the synagogue, what he was looking for was a personal relationship with God. He just didn't know it was going to be through Jesus Christ. So sin wants to keep us right where we are in a self-contained, self-centered atmosphere where the world literally spins around us. That's sin. Call it what you want. The outward expression of sin is manifested in many ways. As simple as telling someone something that's not true to get something you think you want, to robbing a bank and killing somebody, and all in between. That's the simplicity of sin. Give me, give me. I want it. I need it. The opposite of sin is a life that is turned over to God. A life that says, not me, but you, Lord. A life that says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Therefore, this life I live in the flesh, I will live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Paul was trying to tell these Jews and Gentiles all through Acts after his first conversion. Now here at North Hills, we've boiled that down to five, five main transformational thoughts or words or phrases that describe the opposite of a life focused on sin and self. And those phrases are transformational living. Authentic relationships, intimate conversations with God, experiencing the presence of God, and having a humble heart to serve. Now, if you'll think about those five things, use that kind of as a Richter scale or a litmus scale or some kind of a scale to see where you fall right now in your life and using thanksgiving as the meter or guide on that scale, how would you grade yourself today? Would you give yourself strong points in transformational living? Would you say that your relationships really are built on authenticity? Could you say that you do seek to have intimate conversations with God in your prayer life? Can you honestly say that you seek to experience the presence of God Monday through Sunday? 
and that you have a heart to serve. Paul's life was radically changed because of what Jesus did in his life. And you could see it on the inside and the outside. There was nothing fake about that. Things can be counterfeited from money to precious metals to even diamond earrings like the fake ones that I bought my wife after she lost the real ones. Did I tell you about the zirconium earrings that I, I think I did. Everything can be fake counterfeited, copied. But the true heart of a believer, like Paul, the true heart of Paul, wanted to take that message of thanksgiving and tell the whole world what Jesus had done in his life. When we think about thanksgiving, we have so much to be thankful for. You know, probably as a country, we have too much to be thankful for. I really would like to say that in all honesty, we have too much to be thankful for. If we really had what most of the world had, we would really be thankful to get any kind of a meal on Thanksgiving, much less to be able to eat so much that we can barely get up off our seats and we have to go take a nap or lay still for the next couple of hours because we honestly believe if we get up, we're just going to bust. How many people in the world have that luxury? Did you know that we could feed about three quarters of the world on the scraps that we throw away every year in this country? Now, folks, that's something to be embarrassed about, not thankful for. You see, there's a difference from being thankful deeply and genuinely in your heart for what God has done to be boastful and proud about what you look around and think that you or your country has done. I believe this still is a great country, but we had better get our minds straight and our hearts back on God. God's not going to put up with what's going on much longer in this country. I'm not a naysayer, but God cannot and will not allow a country to be as braggadocious and boastful and prideful as ours to have so much and to ignore the world in the ways that we have. He's not going to put up with that. That reminds me, next week, Sunday morning, for a few minutes, we're going to have a missionary come and tell us how the gospel is unhindered, will not be stopped, and has breached behind boundaries that we would not even imagine. He's going to share a few minutes about his work in North Korea. A lot of us didn't even know that we have a work going on in North Korea. But I pray that you'll come and hear part of his story next week, and then I'll wrap that up, really focusing in on this word unhindered and what that means. But first, we want to get to Paul's heart, understand his mission, and then to apply that to us this morning. So if you are keeping notes, we have three points. The first one is that Paul was thankful because he was full of thanks. The second point we'll get to is that when it comes to thankfulness and accepting Jesus, some are convinced but yet they don't commit their life to that. And the third point, we're going to look at what it means to be a committed Christian versus being a counterfeit Christian. So the point one, you've got your Bible. We're going to be looking at Acts 28. I'm going to read verse 11. Paul was thankful because he was full of thanks. Paul has just been in a ship. They've been shipwrecked. Things have been a mess. It's been months now. Um, they're going on an Alexandrian ship, and they're headed up from uh, below the boot of Italy up into Rome, which is on the east side, on the Mediterranean side. And uh, it says that when they arrived, there were some believers there in verse 14, and they invited them, Paul and the others, to stay with them for seven days. And then it says, thus we came to Rome. Paul made it to Rome. He knew most likely he would die there, but yet he was set out to go to Rome and tell the Jews in Rome about Jesus. That was his primary goal. Certainly the Gentiles in Rome would hear the good news 
more of them would convert and accept Jesus, but Paul still holds the Jews in his heart. Now, how many times have we read in Acts, Paul basically giving up on the Jews. He says, I can't believe you guys don't get it. I'm turning away from you. It's like he walks away from the synagogue time and time again. But he always goes back because they're family. They're his people. We're going to see that he writes the book to the Romans and he's pouring out his broken heart. How he pleads with them that they would turn to know Jesus. But we see here in verse 15, the brethren, they all heard about Paul. They came as far away as uh, some market in Appius and the three inns to meet them. I'm not sure exactly where these were. But when they came together, Paul says that he saw them and he thanked God. Underline that in your Bible if you'd like. Verse 15, he saw them and he thanked God and took courage. Paul was all about thankfulness. We recognize in multiple times, throw up those verses that we've got, in 1 Corinthians, Thessalonians, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Romans, in multiple occasions, Paul says, I thank my God constantly for you. Paul will say, we thank God for you. Paul will say, give thanks to God for he is worthy. Thanksgiving was one of the most important words in the life of Paul because he had received it. And, and that's why I'm just not real sure everyone here understands what it means to be thankful because we have so much. And so when Christmas rolls around and you, you've got an old cell phone and someone gives you a new cell phone, you can be happy, but where's the thanks in that? You've got an old car and someone gives you a newer car. You've got an old pair of shoes and someone gives you a new pair of shoes. But we really, I don't think, understand what it means to be thankful. I was reflecting back to one Christmas when my parents gave me an unbelievably nice gift. And I think I must have been about 17 or 18 years old. And I got this gift. And I was so overwhelmed with the kindness of that gift. As a little boy, I went upstairs. Yeah, a little boy, 17. Began to shed some tears. And I realized that inside of me there is a thankful heart. But I didn't know Jesus at those times, those years of my life. It's like Jesus was wanting to get out through that thankfulness. But it wasn't until the time in my life, I guess I was uh, 20, that I accepted Jesus and really understood what it meant to have something to be thankful for. That's what Paul was trying to get out. He was trying to convince these Jews to be thankful. And for Paul, it's, for Paul, this is what we have to understand, church, is that his thankfulness was directly tied into his commitment. Now think on that for just a moment. Paul's thankfulness was tied in directly to his commitment because you can't have true thankfulness without commitment to something. And that's why I believe our country is in a very difficult place because we really don't have anything to be committed to. As a country, we're not sure what we're committed to. We used to be one country under God, but now we're not one country under God. We're a country that is so diverse and yet we have nothing that holds us together. But yet there's still this need inside of us for God, but we don't recognize it. Someone gave me an article just recently about some atheists that have decided they're going to join together and form their own atheist church. Now think about this for a minute. What they're gathering around in their believing is believing there's no God. That's what brings them together. 
But what's interesting is the article goes on and it interviews the people. And they go, well, you know, yeah, we were raised in churches and we were brought up to socialize and to fellowship. And we knew about goodness and kindness and love and thanksgiving. But uh, we just, you know, we don't believe in God. And so over the years, we've recognized that we have this need to come together, but we have nothing to come together for. So since we're all atheists, we'll just come together because we're all atheists. Now, you, you see the irony in that? God has put in everyone's heart this need. He's drawn everybody to him. There is this inbred need within our very being. And those of us who have come to know Jesus know it's from Jesus. Know it's all about the cross and the resurrection. It's no, we know it's all about salvation. But these atheists, they're, they're still trying to figure it out. And the only way they'll understand it is when they meet Jesus face to face. Some of you have experienced that. You know just what I mean. Some of you may have experienced it or you think you have, but you're not sure. And some of you know you haven't. Maybe you're waiting. Maybe you don't care right now. And so that was Paul's life. He was committed thankful he knew that he knew he was with some brethren who knew they knew and they were thankful but then he gathers around in Rome some of the leading men of the Jews and he begins to share the gospel with them and we see very clearly the divide between some believing that what Paul said made sense but they weren't willing to be committed to what Paul was teaching. That's the second point. There are some people, and I do believe that there's some here today, that you hear the gospel, you hear it preached, you've heard it told to you as a very young child, maybe in Sunday school, you're convinced that the words are true, but you've not come to a place in your life where you are committed to what you are seeing or hearing. And so Paul gathers these people together. They're leading men of the Jews. And Paul begins to share with them the gospel. And all the way from verse 16 down to 24, they're coming together and they're seeing him in chains in verse 20. They're hearing him preach. And they're saying, we've heard about you. This whole place called Rome is in a buzz because we know that you're here and you've been on your way coming and we want to know what this is all about. So come and tell us. So from morning to evening, morning to evening, Paul is talking to them. There's large numbers they've gathered together. In verse 23, they set the day aside. A large number came together. He was explaining to them about the kingdom of God. And it says that he was trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets from morning to evening. And look at verse 24. Mark verse 24. It says, Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. That's the way it was 2,000 years ago. It's the way it was 1,000 years ago. And it's the way it is today. And it may be for some of you. There's some of you here today. You're hearing what's being said. And you may believe that that's an argument where you have been persuaded. And you're leaning towards accepting God. But yet you've not committed your life. See, we're called as a church to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's no doubt about that. That's our calling. That's our purpose. That's our reason for being here as a church. If you were to ask here in America how many people would say that they are Christians or at least there is a God, what percentage would you think would say they're Christian in this country? 60? A little higher maybe? 70? A strong percentage, a strong majority of people in this country would be persuaded. Yes, there's a God. 
We know there's a God. We believe in the historical Jesus. We believe he went to the cross and he suffered. We believe that he rose from the dead. Yes, we believe all that. But then you would ask them on Sunday why they don't commit themselves to a local church. And that's where they are separate from those of us here this morning. That's why our country is in such a dangerous position. That's why God, I believe, is looking at our country with judgment in mind. Because he's seeing a people who say they're supposed to be transformed in their living, and most of them would accept Jesus Christ as God, but yet their life doesn't show it. There are relationships that are not authentic. They're not communicating with God in any form or fashion They're not even experiencing the presence of God and they have no humble heart to serve. That's what we call counterfeit Christianity. And that's what Paul was confronting. Constantly he was sharing the gospel with people. People would say they believe or at least they're persuaded in that argument. But then later on Paul would come back and communicate with them and he would realize they had no clue what they were talking about because their life had not been transformed and committed to the gospel. Like perhaps some of you here today. You're not really committed. You're part way there, but you've not made that decision to go all the way and to be committed in your life with Jesus. It says that when they were listening, now get the picture. There were some who were hearing what Paul had to say, and they were persuaded, they were convinced, they were committed. But on the other hand, there were others who would not believe. And it says in verse 25, when they did not agree with one another, they began to leave Paul. And they began to depart from that place. But then it says the Holy Spirit came and spoke to the group that was there. The Holy Spirit came and spoke through Isaiah the prophet. Now this time of the year, we are remembering one of the Baptist missionaries who went into the world and truly sacrificed her life for the gospel. She was a missionary. Her name was Lottie Moon. You've heard of her. We've taken up the Lottie Moon offering Christmas after Christmas, and it's a heritage that we hold on to as Southern Baptist because she had a heart to serve. We think about Isaiah. Actually, if you would like to turn, turn to Isaiah. We'll find it in chapter 6. The text, the text that is being quoted here basically is verses 9 and 10 out of Isaiah 6. But I want to read to you verse 8. I'm sure Luke had a reason for not writing that in there, or Paul had a reason for not saying it. But as someone who's committed to missions and as a pastor of a church that is called to be committed to missions, we think about Isaiah. When the Spirit of the Lord, the same Holy Spirit that moved upon these people where Paul was, the same Holy Spirit moved upon Isaiah and it's written in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. Isaiah is quoted to say, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. That was Isaiah. Here I am, Lord, send me. That was Bill and Debbie. Here we are, Lord, send us. Numerous mission friends that went all over the world. Here we are, Lord, send us. As well as many of you who've dedicated your life. And the Spirit says to Isaiah, Paul's quoting this in Acts chapter 28, verse 26. Go to the people and say, you'll keep on hearing, but you won't understand. You'll keep seeing, but you won't perceive. The heart of the people's become dull. Their eyes, their ears can scarcely hear. They've closed their eyes. Least they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand 
with their hearts. In other words, what Paul is saying is the Jews had become so big, so so powerful, so important to themselves. They missed seeing God at work. They missed hearing God working and talking to them. And that's where I believe, folks, we're getting close to as a country. We're hearing, but we're not listening. We're looking, but we're not seeing and understanding. And we're losing authenticity in the church. And when we lose authenticity in the church and people come in from outside the church who are looking for something real, Because remember, that's what God put in the heart of Adam and Eve. That's what God put in the heart of even those atheists. Those atheists were so burned out on counterfeit Christians. They'd given up. And I can't blame some of them for some things that I've heard in churches that have gone on. And the way Christians who call themselves Christians have treated other people who are Christians or non-Christians. It's embarrassing. And so we as a church come to a place where we are having our eyes open, but we're not seeing what God wants us to see. We're listening with our ears open, but we're not hearing what God is wanting us to hear. And so in a way... We are a country that has infiltrated the churches and there are counterfeit Christians in the churches. And of course, we don't know who's going to heaven and who's not because we're not the judge. But we look at people and they talk like Christians. They act like Christians, at least on the outside. They do things that make us think they're Christians. They're on the membership role. They've walked the aisle. They're maybe serving They might even be teachers, leaders, deacons, and pastors. But inside there's this counterfeit. And we're looking for the real thing and not seeing it. That's why it's so easy for a pastor to let a congregation down. It's easy because you want the pastor to be on a pedestal in some ways to live and act like a Christian so you're confident that there's at least one Christian at church when you come on Sunday. Now, I'm joking. But some people, I was going to say Christian, some people are that way. They want others to live the Christian life for them. Counterfeit Christianity. 